Um, our next storyteller is brought is gifted in many ways. I understand. Anyway, he's brought a book with him today over there for sale. Uh, stories from the Gob Pile, and uh, so make a, a warm welcome for Mike Froman. This will be my first attempt at storytelling, to the public anyway. Um, I've worked in the mines for 12, 13 years. I moved up to Eastern Kentucky 52 years ago, but I'm not a native. <laughs> but I'm pretty much uh, took up the language and everything else, and I used to work underground and we'd tell stories. In the mines, you know, we'd sit around at lunchtime and tell stories and things like that. So I collected a bunch of these stories and put them down in a book. And these are just some of them. This one's called Love Triangle Underground. Where there's this man that he was exceedingly uh, jealous of one of his best friends because his wife was beautiful. And he'd always wanted to date her and ask her out, but he's always afraid to. So his friend had asked her out, and they worked together in the mines all the time. Well, back then, the mines was pretty well unsafe. They didn't have roof bolts. They cut mining timbers and stuck them up underneath the roof to hold it up. And uh, so as they went, when they got out of a section, what they call a section, they'd pull those timbers out and the section would fall and the weight would get off of the mines so they could work and got mines more coal. Well, this one gentleman, he, he's, he got jealouser and jealouser. He just got to where he couldn't hardly stand anymore and he kept trying to think of ways that he could get rid of this guy so he could have his wife. And of course, she didn't know anything about it. She was oblivious to the attentions of this gentleman. She thought he was just a good friend with her husband. So anyway, he came up with a plan one day. They were pulling pillars, what they call pulling pillars, and they would pull out all the roof uh, joists, the roof mine, gosh, oh, timbers, roof timbers. They'd pull out all these posts and let the, this whole section of, of the mine set down, and that would take the weight off the rest of the mine. So they were assigned to pull the pillars, and so they went in there and started working. And they go through and they hook a chain or something on that post and pull it for a little bit till it started leaning, and then they would give it a good yank and it would fall down. But they didn't do it on every post, they just did it on every other post or so, because they didn't want the top to fall down yet. So this one feller came up, the one that was, that was jealous, he came up with a plan that he would go in there and he'd take mining caps plastic caps, little small caps that you set off. And he tied them onto these posts at different places. And then he sent this, so when the other fellow came in to work, he'd already put the rock dust down and hidden the, the post, the, the wires and everything. And this fellow would go in there and so he talked him into going up there in the face, which is the front of the mine that's not been mined yet. He took him up there and talked him into pulling those pillars out, getting ready to let the mine set down. So he hid around the corner of the of the mine opening, of the heading, it's basically called a heading. Uh, most mines are laid out like streets. They have blocks, they have headings, they have what, what, the, what you would call going from one block to the other would be a, you know, opening, and then there'd be another long one to run all the way outside for ventilation, all kinds of different things. You could talk for an hour on all different things going on in the mine. So anyway, he went around the heading, and this other guy kept on working. He kept working and working. And finally, they got ready to, to set these shots off to blow the mine timbers out. And so the one feller that was trying to be get rid of this guy, 
he talked to me to go up and checking the the wires again because he pretended like he was going to set them off. They didn't go off. So the guy crawled back up in there, and this fella hooked up the mine wires on his little plunger, which is a blaster. He makes an electric charge, sends through the wires, and blows up the blasting caps. And so he talked to me to go up there and check him because he pretended like he did, wouldn't go off. And when he got up there near the face, he pulled out that little shooting box and he started telling him, he says, I'm going to kill you because my wife, your wife, is in love with me and I'm in love with her. And of course, she didn't know anything about it because he was just crazy, I guess, what you would call it. So he talked to him going up there and that boy started crawling back toward him. And he had his light on and everything and he was crawling as fast as he could. And that guy, just about the time he got about 10 or 15 feet away from him, pushed a plunger down and all the shots went off at one time. But when that happened, you could hear a big rumbling noise way in the distance, like And it was the top rolling, what they call rolling. And what it was doing, it was falling down from the back to the front. And about that time, this fella's light went out. And he couldn't see the other guy's light because there was so much dust from the mine top falling down. And so they got near, he got sitting there and he's looking around, he peeked around that corner of the, of the mine break to see if he could see this guy's light. He couldn't see no light. And then about that time, boom, the top set down about three feet away from him. The wind blew his hat off and the night rolled him backwards. And so he's sitting there in the mines and the top had quit rolling and he just kept sitting there and sitting there. And the next morning, when the rest of the miners came in, they found him sitting there leaning against the rib and his hair was all white and his mouth was open and his eyes were big and huge. And they couldn't figure out what, was, what happened to him. He's dead. What happened to him? So they got to looking around and they saw where the top had come down real close and there's some rocks had rolled off of it and one of them was laying on his leg. So they didn't think anything about it and they picked up that rock and underneath was the other guy's hand wrapped around this one's ankle. <laughs> and, uh, so that was, that was that story. Things didn't work out. And then we, I got all kinds of, God, I got all kinds of, I talk too fast, don't I? <laughs> uh, well, anyway, this collection of stories that I have written about are just all short stories. There's nothing real long in it. And, and some are true and some are false. You don't uh, just have to make your own decision on. But uh, I've worked in over 150 different mines in my career where I worked for surveyor crews and helped lay out mines and things like that. And uh, so I've gathered up a lot of stories. <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to think, what's another one? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. That was Love Triangle. And let's see, all right. This one's about Clementine. There's this man, they had a farm, and he had a daughter named Clementine. And this is back in the 1800s, so everybody had to work. He had to work. His wife was dead. And he'd go out there, and he'd plow the fields. And Clementine would come behind him and uh, do what they call clod hopping, which is basically getting the big clods of dirt and stomping on them to make them smaller so that you could grow things. So they're out there working and everything, and... And uh, Clem looked more like a man than she did a woman because she always been working her whole life. And uh, she always wore long johns and bibbed overalls. And she had these big old boots that she jumped around in. And so she's out there stomping around and he says, you know, we need some coal. And so you need to go to the bank and get some coal uh, or it'll freeze tonight. So coal bank at that time 
was usually owned by a family, and they had a place on the mountains where they would dig in and get coal. And it wouldn't be very big. Sometimes it might be 30, 40 feet deep. And it might be bigger than that. Depends on how long they've been working at it. They call it the coal bank, which is how we got coal banks. And so everybody's family had a bank, so, so, so it seemed. So she hooked up the horse, or the mule really, hooked up the mule and got in the wagon and away she went. And it, it was about a 15, 20 minute ride till she got to this coal bank. And they had been doing this for a long time, so their coal bank was pretty deep. And you had to have a candle or a lantern to go in there and, and get the coal out. Then you'd go in, you get take the pick, and bang on the coal a little while and get some lumps or, you know, pretty good sized pieces of coal and put them in the buggy, take them back to the house. So she goes in there, she's walking along, and you got that lamp in front of her. It's just like she just has a little coal lamp, a little small one, one flame on it, that's all there was. So she goes in there and she sets down in front of the coal bank and she gets that pick and she starts digging. While she's digging, she kept hearing. She looked around, she didn't see nothing, because it was shadows, you know, just one little candle and it showed shadows all over the place. So she started picking again, and then she heard, Rrr. She started, kept digging, she'd look around and see what she could see. Couldn't see nothing. And finally, it's something went, Rrr. She jumped real loud, and when she did, she knocked over that candle, so it was black in there now. And she felt something get hold of her her long johns and start pulling on them. And so she's screaming and yelling and going on, and she's trying to get away, and it kept pulling her and pulling her. She couldn't get away. So she just unfastened that old coverall, galoshes there, throwed one button off, and boom, right, she came out of them things. And she heard whatever it was back there going, rawr, 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 rawr. heard the big scratch marks and carrying on. She couldn't figure out what was going on. So she took off a crawling as fast as she could, and when she got outside the mine, she just took off a run. Here she's running these red coverall, overall, I mean, uh, Long Johns, running them big red Long Johns and then boots, and she's just running as fast as you go. Well, at most of the time when people saw her, they thought it was a man. They always called her Clem. So her husband, her, her father came up one day. Well, the day she didn't show up for dinner that night, so he came looking for her. And when they got to that mine, that coal bank, there was the buggy and the car, the cart still sitting there with the mule still hooked up. So. He got a mining lamp, which is a little bit bigger than a candle, and he went inside. And when he got in there, he found her pair of coveralls, tore all two pieces. Big strips tore out of it, and this and that and the other. And he looked down, and it looked like something had wrestled on the ground of the coal bank. And he turned around real fast, and there was a big old bear laying there asleep. So apparently Clem had disturbed this bear that was hibernating in the coal bank. And the bear had got hold of her and tore it all to pieces where her dad thought, she's dead, he's killed her because here's her coveralls tore all to pieces. You know, so he went back out, they took the coal back home and they had a funeral for her even though they couldn't find no body. They kept, you know, four or five years later, they were, yeah, her dad happened to go to town and there was a, a pamphlet or a poster, poster put on the wall. And it showed this woman, okay, and she was standing there and had her hands above her head like a ballet dancer. And he got to looking real close and she had boots on. He thought, well, I've never seen a ballet dancer with boots on before. And he got to looking a little harder and it wasn't leotard she had on, it was a pair of long red underwear. And so he got to thinking about it. He said, nah, couldn't be. Sure enough, when they came to town with this big old oh, opera or something, whatever they call it, dance recital, whatever, there she was up there in the front row, her cap, big old boot and galoshes on her clod hoppers, and she had a little dress on around on top of that cover overalls. Her. And there she was, and she had run till she got to New York and got a job as a ballet dancer. <laughs> and 
that she was traveling around the country and she came back to her hometown and her dad recognized her. So now they got they call her Dancing in New York. That's what it's called. <clears throat> There's a another one that I like to, to tell that's a, a little longer. It's a, called the coal bucket. And back in the 1800s, mines didn't have a whole lot of, there was no electric engines. There were no electric mo automobiles or anything. The only way in and out was the train. And the coal camps were built on either side of a railroad track, you know, because that's where the miners lived. And of course, all the kids wanted to play on the railroad track, of course. And what it was, when the tipple let go of the coal gons, it rolled down by gravity. It would run down the hill and bang into the coal truck gons that was already there. So they were all the time getting and playing on them tracks. And sometimes they'd go up there and they'd have coal buckets and they'd gather up coal, lumps of coals that fell off the trains for their families. And, and, and so there was a, a guard they were supposed to keep these kids off of the track when these trains, guns came rolling down. Well, the boss of the mines, he was called Big Boss, had a big fancy house on the hill. You know, he wanted to live in those little shanty houses. And so he was really strict on these kids about getting in the coal guns. He was all the time coming down there and pulling them off and tell them to go home and threaten them for the ads with firing them or whatever. And he would go and uh, talk to the guards and tell them they need to be tougher on these boys and girls getting that coal. So one day he was out walking down the track looking for kids and or just whatever, checking the coal guns and everything. And they turned the coal gun loose and when, when they turned it loose, it starts off real slow. You know, just one, two, three, you know. And the next thing you know, it gets rolling faster and faster till it slams into the next coal gone. Well, he looked down the hill, and there was two boys down there, or three, he couldn't tell because it was getting close to dark, playing on the coal guns, between the coal guns and stepping in between and gathering up coal and stuff. So he took off a running to beat this coal gone down, he was gonna go down there and try to chase the boys off. And so he was running and he finally got in front of that coal gone because it didn't roll very fast, but it was a lot of weight, about 30 tons. And so he got down there and the next morning, they found him dead mashed between the coal gones. He was caught between the tongue and the striker plate there on the coal tongue and they couldn't figure out why he was stuck between them two coal guns. And so what had happened is he had got there before the coal gun had, and he grabbed them boys and literally just threw them off the track. But he didn't have enough time for him to get off himself, and he was killed. So back then in those days, if you're, you know, there was no insurance, there was no uh, workman's comp or anything like that. Uh, when you didn't work, you didn't get paid, you didn't get to buy food or whatever. So his wife uh, had to move out of the house because a new boss was going to be brought in. And they moved her down into the shanty town, which was the poorest part of town. And that's where she had to live. About 10 years later, they were just still working. And they heard about this new boss that was coming that was supposed to be meaner than the old one was. So everybody was waiting and anticipating for this guy to come. And sure enough, when he got down there, he was just as tough as the old boss was. He'd run up and down the track, ride around, tell him to stay out of the coal, or made him get out between the coal guns and everything. Everybody's complaining about him, he's being so mean. Well, the little old lady that had been left the widow of the old boss had fallen on pretty hard times and she was getting up in the years and she would go out during the day and take a coal bucket. She had an old beat up rusted coal bucket 
and she lived in a little one room house and had a little dog. That's all she had. Didn't have a hardly a big fireplace, but a fire in to start with. So she was pretty much starving to death. And everything was going on. So she got out one day, was going around picking up that coal, and the heart the, the new boss come up and seen her doing that. He says, What are you doing? She says, I'm gathering up some coal. Uh, so I won't freeze to death tonight. He said, get out of here. It's too dangerous for somebody your age. And uh, he asked, what's your name, by the way? And she told him. He said, Phew, get out of here. So she went home. She only had about half a bucket full of coal. And they always set it on the porch, and they would take it inside and put it in the fire, and then set the bucket back outside. So she got up the next morning, and her coal bucket was gone. In this place was a brand new coal bucket, shiny, filled up with coal. She thought, well, huh, who did that? She looked around, didn't see anything, see anybody around. She kept looking and looking. She didn't see anything. She said, well, so she took it inside and built her a nice good fire this time because she had enough coal to do it with, keep warm, and her and the little dog. And so the next day, She's laying in bed, and she got up, went outside, and sure enough, there was another coal bucket full of coal. And on top of it was a couple little bones. She thought, well, huh, who did that? Nobody knew. Nobody saw anything. She asked her neighbors. They said, no, I haven't seen nothing. So this went on for a couple weeks. And finally, uh, she thought, well, I'm going to stay up and see who this is. She tried to stay up, couldn't stay awake. Next morning, here's her coal bucket all filled up, had a couple bones and some biscuits on it for her. So she was, this went on for a year or so, and finally she got to the point where she couldn't get up and go, and she finally passed away. And so everybody's wondering why that coal bucket was sitting on the porch full and her dead, you know. And they come to find out that the new boss, the hard boss, was one of the boys that had been saved by her husband 10 years earlier. And he had thrown him away from the Kogon and been killed himself. And when he saw her suffering and basically paying for her husband dying, he decided he would save her. And so he would get the coal. He couldn't come out and do it himself because that wouldn't look right. But he kept gathering up the coal every day and putting the, the bones and stuff on there for the little dog.